So the the light is there's very interesting angle and it pertains to COVID and how we de deal with infection and also to diabetes. If you're out under the sun, you make vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And of course, the dilemma is if you go in the Californian sun, if you spend too much time under the sun unprotected, your vitamin D might finally go up, but you're going to get eventually a melanoma. So it's it's a difficult balance altogether. We are back with Dr. Matthias von Herrath. Can you say your name for me? Matthias von Herrath. It's a German word. Herrath. 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 Uh, I was yeah, like, well, once you're ready to get a cough attack, yes. and then you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Matthias and I have had a really great conversation. We're continuing on right now talking about um, obesity and so much more. Hope you guys enjoy. But I'll tell you, I'm studying this other doctor that I'm going to have on the show that I'm really excited about. And I really think you should look into this with your with your research because we talked about obesity. So let me pull up my note from this last um, bit that I was studying. He was talking about how obesity isn't about what you eat. And I was like, wait, what? And my jaw hit the floor. Um, he's like, we talk about it as like calories in, calories out. He says that the root cause of it is that we've gone away from the light. Modern light wasn't invented, what, 1939 or something? So we were designed to be outside, and now we're all inside. And now we're all on blue light with phones and stuff. And so he talks about, um, he says that something gets bigger as it loses energy. So that's why people... Because, you know, when you go outside, you're getting the light. The light is going in. It's being processed. Um, and so anyway, this is something that I'm really I'm really trying to study. And I, I have all these questions for him because to me, um, I, I, think sugar, some cool I think sugar robs you. I think sugar robs you of energy. So then that could also be contributing. But tell me about what you're studying with the light. So the, the light is, there's very interesting angle and it pertains to COVID and how we de deal with infection and also to diabetes. If you're out under the sun, you make vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And of course, the dilemma is if you go in the Californian sun, if you spend too much time under the sun unprotected, your vitamin D might finally go up, but you're going to get eventually a melanoma. So it's, it's a difficult balance altogether. So what came out of these light considerations though is that most of us are vitamin D deficient. Mm -hmm. And vitamin D is really the evidence that it's critical for the immune system. Oh my God, it's the it's common huge. denominator it's, across all cancers. It's huge. There's and all the doctors tell us to stay yeah. out of the sun and wear toxic sunscreen. Yes, um, so 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 I, I've been taking my little vitamin D pills and I to, do of course my bike rides, but as I said before, it's a fine balance because of skin cancer and sun intensity, but but if, if you get the early sun, the early better. sun is the safest. Yeah. And then if you have enough vitamin D, uh, things go better for the beta cell protection. Things go better in terms of keeping the immune system away from islet replacement. So in, in the Diabetes Research Institute in Miami, a big goal is that we replace from stem cells the islets of patients with type 1 diabetes. And I have great hope into this that we can do this. The last frontier is to keep the immune system away from the islets. And one part of this is you got to have enough vitamin D. So vitamin D See? is sort of like a basic staple where you start. You don't want to start here. You want to start here. And then you want to build on this in a tolerable fashion to keep the immune system away either from your inner pancreas or from the newly transplanted islets. And so I'm, I'm really excited, I should say, that hopefully this eventually will Will, will will lead to a cure. Also, when you already have the disease, that you can, like just in quotes, have a little transfer of new beta cells and you yeah. maybe get them under the skin or in the fat pad and then you can put them back in and uh, you can heal patients with, with diabetes. So that's, that's, that's like a big hope. But vitamin D... Is it is is off the center of of many of these things? Yeah. Well, he says that um, Palm C. Do you know about Palm C in the brain? Mm -hmm. It's a gene, and light um, light is so important for Palm C. And again, my civilian brain 
just brings it down to no POM C equals illness. And so the brain, the brain needs all of this light to do all of its processes and, and to help you, but we're staying away from the light. And if he thinks obesity and he was obese at one point and he went back to the light and lost all his weight, um, I just thought that was really fascinating for diabetes as well as, and, and by the way, for so many conditions, MS is at higher rates, the northern, more Northern you go, um, Massachusetts has one of the That's highest correct. rates, That's but if correct. you go to the equator, That's correct. it's a very different story. And, and apparently, I don't know for sure, this isn't, I'm still learning all of this, but apparently if you have MS and you move to the equator, you're going to have a much better time, perhaps even heal. Yeah, this is very interesting you bring this up. So this north-south gradient, especially from MS, has been known for a long time. and they have Not been... by regular people, though. No, we okay. don't know these things. No that's doctor why... in the doctor office is telling us this. That's why we have to have many of these. <laughs> that's why we have to have many of these shows. I, I, I think it's actually scientific communication and, and like the more nerdy stuff that we think about that the that everybody gets to hear them. I think we do way too little of this. Mm -hmm. In the DRI, my main action when I came was to put a communications office because it's so central. Yeah. But coming back to this north-south gradient, it, it it is it's confounding, and you're right, we don't know. And it could be the light. It could also be there have been always wild theories about this. The type of infections you have if you live more equatorial. They will be different than what you have mm -hmm. if you live in northern Finland. And it's actually for, for type 1 diabetes, you also see some of these gradients. It is very high in the Scandinavian countries. Type 1? Yeah, so... Again, no light. That, that, right? Yes, yes. For myself, I have burned it down for now for, 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 for vitamin D. I haven't dared to quite yet infect myself with some funky warms that doesn't see <laughs> nothing. Some what? Some warms. There was all these theories that if you have uh, parasites, maybe that keeps autoimmunity at bay. That ah. didn't sound so appealing to me, so yeah. I haven't done it. Yeah, that... I wouldn't recommend it, but it uh, sounds also icky. But that, that type of uh, observations are probably very, very interesting. It led to a hypothesis that still is popular that is called the hygiene hypothesis, that if you keep your immune system too clean, it starts getting in a way too unbusy and starts getting inflamed and attacking your own organs. Because it's, yeah, it needs to do something. But that's that something is, of mm. course, a difficult, uh, it's not easy because you can't say, oh, well, if it does something, you get COVID, that's good for you. It's probably yeah. really not good for you at all, right? So it's it's a it's a difficult dilemma in, i want to talk about covid because when i was diagnosed i tried to make sense of what was happening because i was also meditating for full mind body and soul healing and there was a study out of mass general that said that diabetes and brain tumors can't coexist and i said that doesn't make any sense right because um because diabetes is high blood sugar and well, actually, no, I don't remember what I thought of in the moment, but I saw the study and it said brain tumors and diabetes can't coexist. So I said, wait, I've been asking for my full healing. Maybe this tumor came, or the diabetes came to heal me of the tumor. And so I kind of went down that rabbit hole. Do you know anything about that? Have you ever heard anything like that? I, I would more think that, uh, like what we said before, if you have too much stress and inflammation, all these things, the autoimmune diseases and also cancers are more frequent, right? Just like... But even it, a benign brain tumor? I don't know. I mean, b benign brain tumors as, as, as you have... I mean, you, you had so many things that you <laughs> overcame with a positive <laughs> attitude, which I find absolutely mind-blowing. The Thank strength... You. I mean, it's not... I mean, yeah, benign, yeah, but still these things grow, you know, you got, and you got to take them out and you know all about this, yeah. that that's not, none of this is so easy, yeah. you know, we make it sound maybe sometimes easy and, and sure it could have been worse, but I mean, it, it, this is still a big deal. Do you know what's here. crazy? I've never actually thought to say this, but I think that this stuff 
was so much easier than the other stuff I've dealt with. The other stuff I dealt with made no sense. The torture people inflicted on me in the workplace, the torture I dealt with in other arenas of my life, like that, none of it made sense. At least, okay, this makes sense. I had a rough journey. These things manifested in my body. I know what I'm going to do. For some reason, this did feel easier to me than the shit I went through before, if that makes any sense. It makes sense to me personally because I feel... If we get a wake up call or whatever you want to call it, I had a pretty bad bike accident in 2011 and I bonked my head and I was psychologically quite off kilter. If Mm. you would ask my wife, she'd probably tell you more about this. And I I didn't know, I didn't feel it well, but I didn't know how to get back. But I tried to change afterwards many things in my life. So uh, uh, in terms of severity, for sure, the bike accident was not as much as having a brain tumor. But just to have a cut telling you, look at buddy, <laughs> maybe it does to change to make some changes. I think that's that's fundamentally important to take a step back uh, out of a rat race. Also in academia, yes. it's 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 terrible. And you can imagine, I would imagine, like in any uh, profession, it can be pretty abrasive. And if you don't, if you let it get to you, it's just going to eat you up. It's going to make you bitter. And in this positivity spirit that you imagine things in your mind that will manifest later on. I Mm -hmm. totally believe in this. Like if we strongly believe we will replace eyelids in people and heal them, at some point this is gonna gonna happen. I mean, us meaning all of humankind, not a specific company or institute, Uh all of us as humankind. This, This mindsets, they work. We put people on the moon. Exactly, with the same type of mindset. We, you know, the, and well, I believe we everything can. Everything impossible is really possible. In some decades, we will prevent these diseases. We will have other problems that we might not know about it right now. And we will be able to uh, replace uh, eyelids that are lost and put them back into people. Sort of like a little, at least, piece of an avatar body. I think we will do this. Yeah. And we will learn how to. Uh, keep the keep the immune system at bay. I I think that's that's uh, where we will be. At least that's that's sort of my my goal beacon. And I hope yeah I I live long enough to to see the solutions. Of I it. think that we're going to nice. see in the next ten years such a massive explosive um, acceleration of so many things, good and bad. Um, but in the healing world, I think it's going to it's going to be incredible. One other study that I came across, and forgive me, friends, I don't have it in front of me. I can't even remember where I put it because I'm super organized. Um, It was something like 42% of people who got COVID got diabetes. And I would mention it in the health world when I'd go to the doctor. And every time I talked to a nurse, she's like, oh, I had it. I got it too. And I was like, was it after COVID? Yep. Yep. Anytime I talk to someone, did you get diabetes after COVID? Yep. Yep. Now, I guess it makes sense because everyone said COVID would attack weak spots. So maybe we were all pre-diabetic and this, you know, accelerated some things, you know, that were going to happen maybe. But have you done any research on COVID and the effect on diabetes? Yeah, we we have been quite engaged in the immunology of COVID for me personally, because I'm interested in making vaccines that in my case tolerate the immune system. So I was quite curious about this whole theme and because of the link of infections and diabetes, which we have worked on for 25 years. So the way it seems to uh, evolve with COVID, what we understand now is that COVID, like many other viruses, when you get a more bigger infection, you have more virus and it will start lodging itself in different parts of your body. It's a little bit of a stroke of the luck. Some viruses like enteroviruses, they can go to the heart, they can go to the brain, they can go to the pancreas and it's random. So COVID can do many of these things to coronaviruses, right? And it goes to the lung for, for known reasons and your throat and so forth. Once it sits in the pancreas, the question is, what could it do to the pancreas? Um, and the evidence is now that if the eyelids are directly infected, that's probably the main factor that makes it not good for eyelid function. And it's rather simplistic. You can say, well, uh, here I have an organ, then the virus comes. Evidently, that might not end so well, and the virus might impair the function. 
The second thing these infections do, and in pretty much all infections do this, they make us insulin resistant while we have them, especially if the infection is severe. So if you have a severe flu and you lie in bed and you have a fever, it means you're probably making interference, which is good because they're supposed to heal the virus out of your body. But interference make you insulin resistant. And that doesn't help because it means even if you're sick, you don't eat much, but still the beta cells have to do extra work paradoxically in that situation because you become more insulin resistant in terms of the effects of insulin is storing sugar, right? It puts it away in your body. And we talked about it before. It's a storage hormone. It also can, if you have too much of it, it can make you gain weight and so forth, right? So I think that's the two mechanisms direct in the pancreas, impairing your eyelids, and the second one making you transiently, as long as you have the infection, insulin resistant. And I think with that, you have COVID and other viruses, notably enteroviruses, being a precipitator of diabetes. And that's an interesting area because um, it relates to the issue, how can we avoid this? Do we build better vaccines? that avoid severe infections? Do we try to avoid these infections altogether? Do we build up better immunity so we don't get these severe systemic infections? It's tricky business, but mm -hmm. there definitely is a link in this way, like you pointed out, and it's something we need to understand even better. But th that's where, where the field is now. Please yeah. ask if I didn't explain this well. No, 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 I, I totally get it. Um, wondering where your research is at for type 1 right now. For someone who's listening who has type 1 or as a family member that has type 1, where are we at? Oh, now you, know, you get me really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we I get mean, excited with what you're about to say. Now, now for the next 50 minutes, I'm going to get in a <laughs> monologue. No. So, so these are exciting times for, for type 1 for two reasons. There has been breakthroughs by the company Vertex, who were the first ones who put stem cell derived eyelets into patients and showed that they can work. So that's actually a big deal. I saw that. I was that's so a big excited. Deal. Yeah, because it's a supply issue. Does we it have to be newly diagnosed or were these people long time diabetics? They were a long time and I come back, back to that. And the second thing that happened is that uh, the company Prevention Bio who are now bought with Sanofi, they have a molecule against T cells. It's called anti-CD3. And they are the first ones to actually brought this to the market to prevent diabetes or delay it, is probably fair to say, by on average about two and a half years. It's now in the US on the market as a drug as t -Zield. These two breakthroughs have really, the second one has taught us we can actually take the immune system back and impact the disease. These, these things were beforehand more animal model based yeah. theoretical consideration now we know we actually it can work it's sort of like you so when do we get it rising or like it. the birdies are flying you think it should be easy to fly but then all of a sudden you actually make it all the way down the hill and you know it might work so what are the the last frontiers and that's why i took the position in the in the diabetes research institute in miami we now need to find the sweet spot, I call it, sort of like making a short flight, a transatlantic flight, in terms of protecting the new eyelids or in pre-diabetes protecting your own eyelids. From the Are the eyelids different than the beta cells? The beta cells sit in the eyelids. Okay. So for all matters, okay. like, the, like the mixture of cells, there are other cells in there too, but it, it, yeah, the beta cells sit in the eyelids. So we, we can... The, the holy grail is now to protect the eyelids in pre-diabetes. You talked in the beginning about prevention. Or after you put in stem cell-derived new eyelids as a transplant. And our focus is to make keeping the immune system, how to say it, not interested in the eyelids. That's our focus. And to do it in a way that it's tolerable for you from a patient perspective. And the key to this is that we combine things so we synergize and protecting the eyelids and we spread any type of side effects because in this disease, as 
you know well there's insulin so so it is not like a terminal cancer where you might only live one year or so we have it has to be a tolerable yeah. immune modulation that doesn't affect your life expectancy that's that's the key to make it mainstream and and you asked what happened with the patients who got the vertex transplant they still had full immunosuppression and full immunosuppression after an organ transplant has side effects it takes the immune system away from looking for infections from looking for cancer so so you're vulnerable to so many other things you yeah fix so, the diabetes but then everything else yeah, yeah you wouldn't want this so so that's what we need to do it's a fine-tuning exercise i don't think it will be something where whoa all of a sudden a magic molecule shows up this is a fine-tuning exercise like it has been in oncology for many cancers you tune the therapies you uh, do the right things we for example we we have this what you i would call a the reverse vaccine, it was le recently called in the press uh, for other people who had this advance. We call it a peacekeeper vaccine to make your immune system to create peace in organs. So we have worked on this for a Whoa. long time, for probably 20 years. Mm -hmm. And if that ever is now in phase one, if we if we can build something that that you could take this, let's say you have a problem with alopecia or arthritis and you make your selective peacekeeper vaccine just for this problem rather than taking your whole immune system down. Just specific. Specific without having side effects. That's sort of our goal. So that's why I'm so excited. These things are now just in the last couple of years they're coming together. Yeah. And we have in, in the DI, we have this interdisciplinarity for, with people from different groups working together. And I just love this that's why i'm so excited about the field per se about the institute specifically it's it's just a, a, a super fun situation and and i keep my fingers crossed uh, that this peacekeeper vaccine that uh, we have been working on with novo Nordisk since uh, probably over 10 years that that's going to make it over over the the finishing line that would be that would yeah. be very cool so i have a question there's so many that wonder if there's already a cure for cancer and they don't give it because so much of our medical system is now reliant on that business. You have to remember medicine is a business. Oh, Healthcare know. is a business. Of course. Of course. So the same thing with diabetes. Diabetes is such a moneymaker for, um, for big pharma and for hospitals and for doctors. So there are a lot of people that believe there's already a cure for diabetes and they hide it. So is there any incentive and how uh, it's such a sad thing to say to someone who's devoting their life to research so <laughs> oh, it's an important question me. i know precisely what you're getting at. yeah so so is it is it something where you feel like uh there is no incentive for big pharma to find a cure for diabetes do you ever feel that like that as a researcher do you ever come across any evidence that would support that so let me break this down because it's different for type 1 and the answer is different for type 1 and type 2 diabetes okay. in, in terms of how the, the process goes. For type 1 diabetes, the argument that pharma industry would lose a lot of money in insulin sales and other things if that disease were completely prevented and cured, that is actually really not true. For the very simple argument because the market compared to type 2 diabetes is just way small it is it is essentially as a if you would think that that sort of is conspiracy it, it makes business wise no sense the market is too small okay um it goes because of this if anything and you ask me there's the other way around because the market is small the incentive to do something about this is comparatively smaller than things that have a big market because of the how we set the drivers in our system because they're commercial entities so that's why i've been my whole life long I'm going to be an advocate to keep things on the track so we do something about this disease because it's so important for patients. So that, that's the truth of where it sits with type 1 diabetes. So the answer is it is not a money pharma argument to stay away from type 1, mm -hmm. but it's an argument we need to do more to keep people interested in this disease, including the pharma industry, because we need to prevent eventually or cure the disease. So so that's how I see it after after 30 years, it's, it's more keeping pharma and small companies, everybody incentivized to work on this disease. For type 2 diabetes, 
And of course, the situation is different. This is comparatively a huge market where lots of monies are earned. But you can say, at least in the recent developments, obesity is a, is a huge risk factor in type 2 diabetes. And we could have a long conversation of what type of obesity, and it's probably more complicated individually where you have fat and where you don't have fat and all these type of things and whether you have inflammation or you don't have inflammation this all ties together but let's say simplified as as obesity it's a risk factor for for type type 2 diabetes and it's a positive development for patients for everybody that the in, the focus has shifted on treating obesity because it's earlier on mm -hmm. in the afferent element, right? And then, and that's, of course, there's money being made there, right? That's our incentive system. But it's better for the patient to not have type 2 diabetes as a whole if you could prevent it, if you can prevent, for example, in this case, obesity. So that's so that's how, how that will play out. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's actually a very good development altogether because anything early prevention and especially if you would then ultimately individualize it that's where the holy grail is you don't want to have this disease yeah. you want to be aware you talked a lot about scans you want to find things early before they become a huge yes. problem you want to give people access to find things early and you want to have a health system that then catches them you give me a test, you say, Matt's not good. <laughs> you got to do something. You want to have a health system that's going to has the time and walks the walk with me and explains to me what a genetic or antibody test or scan result means and what my options are. And, and that, of course, as you know uh, very well, is, is work in progress. But yes. we need to push this. This is better Which for is the why people I of tell the country. people on your team, you should have a team. You need a naturopath because they have the time and you they're do. going to look at your holistic picture. We need the Western doctors for what they're great at and we need the Eastern. That is a very great right. way to break it down. And I, I think this is a great way to think about it. And if, if, if patients can be more empowered, you know more about your disease, mm -hmm. then you can come more targetedly and say, look, right now I have a problem. I just want to have a gastroscopy. And the doctor might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have to look into this, this. and you, But you already know, you know that's what you knew it because you know what your problem is. And you can then use the system more targetedly. Mm -hmm. Not play the system, but use the system like, like a, a minute. Like you're the coach of a yeah, football you're team. You, you want to take this from here. Yep. And then depending what you see in the gastroscopy, you probably need somebody really to talk about it and, and tell you what it means. And you need to have somebody catching you rather than mm -hmm. only seeing you for five minutes is absolutely yeah. essential. I want to ask you about two more things. Nat, help me keep on track because I'm so excited I'm going to forget. I want to talk to you about Ozempic now and then we'll finish with gut microbiome. So what are your thoughts on Ozempic? I mean, obviously so many people are now using it for other reasons. Well, so what I can say, as you know, is, is, is limited because I work for a pharma company. Mm. But... Um, what I said just before, that reducing the burden of obesity will prevent ultimately also type 2 diabetes and many inflammatory diseases and have many positive effects. That's the right way to go because you shift things to an earlier stage. Mm -hmm. You don't just treat, which has been a problem. We, we have been very... In our healthcare system, we treat things when it's too late. You yeah. come for dialysis and then there's centers that can help you with your failed kidneys. But yeah. you want to really be in the spot. You don't want to have a failed kidney. You want to prevent all this from happening. And we talked about nutrition in the beginning. This this has to be a holistic approach. It's not just you take the drug as a fixer. That's of the a thing. You, you need to have a lifestyle modification and individually see how this fits in fits in or doesn't fit in into your individual journey it has to be the whole whole person and the whole persona so so that that's how these things need to to come together i'm very i'm very much into uh, the concept of bringing all of us patients we are all in a way patients bet, better journeys so we can mm -hmm. deal with our individual health problems which undoubtedly at some point all of us will have that's what i say all the time 
it's just a matter of time. So we have to do so much to try to prevent. But I want to ask you just from a, a science perspective, if you're not diabetic and you take something like an Ozempic, um, and now you are not modifying your diet, you're eating as you like, I think my beta cells would say, ah, I don't need to do any work. She's giving me this out here. It's doing the work. I'm going to quit. My, again, civilian brain is saying my concern about it for people who aren't diabetic is you're basically giving your pancreas a pass on having to do its own job and it's going to quit on you. Is that possible? I don't think it's going to go like this, I think, but I think it, what will happen, any drug, we, we, we cannot have the mindset that drugs are, are fixing things like you put a battery in a remote control thing and then if the battery is charged it's just all going to be fine. The drugs help us to modify things in the in the body always at a certain cost of side effects anything you take and they help us to stay on a better journey a better health journey personally and and that's that, that's what what really needs to be be thought about that's that's how i think about this i'm i'm not uh, definitely not a mechanistic thinker about drugs that you have everything compartmentalized you give this one for this this for this this for this and then you end up at the end <laughs> with 20 things you're taking and nobody ever looked at it's also interesting sometimes yes how they interact with each other never never so, no 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 they don't keep track by the way, friends, if you go to the doctor and then you go get more and you get more, they're not realizing that they've piled on. I got a liver disease or I had um, um, liver failure, some some bad thing with my liver when I first moved to LA because I was really sick and the doctor kept giving me medicine and giving me medicine, giving me, and they weren't taking anything off the list. No, no, you have to, you have to, it, it's a self-empowerment. You have to manage your list. You you have to manage your list. Yeah. Because but our system. But the average person thinks the doctor wouldn't do that if it wasn't yeah. right. So that's why I always say you have to be the CEO of your health. Yeah, our our system is, is not great at managing the list. And, and there's this issue of pylon effects. We have to become self-empowered. And I think this type of uh, what you're doing here, this type of dialogue, is is important because we need to make anybody in this country in the world understand science and medicine better and it's actually not so easy it often works with likelihood or risk decisions it's never black and white even if we would like to have it black and white and we are not machines mm -hmm. our body so so many things we do have to be weight against each other and that process uh, will probably come more and more as it seems to to ourselves sort of as the ceo of our own health journey and and, and it's something where we need to empower as many people as we can it will be better and actually things work better if you have your own feedback loop thingy mm -hmm. you know it works because you don't want somebody to tell you, oh, Maria, you should do this, 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 and lecture you about all kinds of things. You come home frustrated, you know, in the worst case, somebody shamed you about some stuff mm -hmm. and you get all grumpy and go like, well, now I'm going to have like four donuts on this to make myself yeah. feel better. You have to be in charge and, and it works better for all it of us, does. right? It uh, works so much better. Yeah, I big. would have never done all of the things that I'm doing if... I didn't empower myself and go out and get this information and be excited about learning it. Now, you know, it, it's such a different journey than someone just telling me what to do. Before I let you go, because we have really gone long, I have to ask you about the gut microbiome and its effect on diabetes. Yeah, so that is a big theme. Uh, you can assume, just if you approach it from the magnitude of the matter, if you take our guts and the whole surface, all the little nooks and crannies the gut has, is like a football field. We have 300 square meters of open interactive surface with bacteria. That's our, you know, symbiotic gut microbiome. And we can't live without it. If you clean it all up and sterilize it, we die. So this is like a symbiotic relationship. We need bacteria to break down our food and different bacteria will do it in a different way. We have over 400,000 entities in there. So it's complicated. Uh, why do I say this? 
first of all, it will impact many, most things in our immune system because the immune system is present there in addition to nutrition and nutrient uh, resorption, right? Uh, but it's also very complicated in terms of the magnitude of different microbes we have in there. I have great hopes that we will be able to sort this uh, with the help of artificial intelligence. You cannot easily assume what you're going to do an elimination biome diet and spend your life eliminating 400,000 bucks yeah. and find out what one versus two number three does. It's not feasible. So those stool tests are not sufficient that are out there? I, I think it's a, it's a good be beginning. Okay. I mean, first of all, stool tests are good for many different things. You can have blood, you can have certain bacteria that are really bad for you that stand out. But for adjusting, the gut, what you're talking about is to adjust your gut biome, microbiome with the right type of diet personalized for you because it's going to be different from you than even members of your family and so forth, right? To, you're talking about adjusting this permanently without using antibiotics, ideally through you know, a natural diet. So it shifts in a direction that doesn't give you certain diseases or enhances the likelihood to have certain diseases. And that link, which I strongly believe is there, is very complex. And I've, I, I uh, family always makes fun of me because I'm not a computer scientist and I'm definitely, I'm super interested in artificial intelligence and, you know, these, these chat GPT things that we are now all using mm -hmm. that have become surprisingly useful for certain things. I think this will solve itself. I went to a biomarker conference he, just here in San Diego a uh, few, few days ago, and the amount of artificial intelligence that they use, in, in the meaning that the, the, the programs can learn and organize themselves to sort to thousands and thousands of markers you can measure and then understand which trajectory you might be on as a given person in terms of disease risk and also treatments, this is this making amazing advances. So but I have a strong belief it, that that will happen to the gut microbiome. How does the gut microbiome affect the diabetes, though? Complex. There, so if it's not working right... Well, there's all kinds of theories that are all probably giving us a glimpse from a little piece. They, they, the gut can be leaky or let too many things through, and this probably plays a role in some ways in diabetes. There's studies, we call them preclinical because they're in animals, that you can um, influence diabetes incidence with certain bacteria but not others, but that's only a few of the whole equation. And then there has been the, uh, the infamous poop transplants mm -hmm. trying to reintroduce gut microbiomes. And they have also shown some effect, but more in the type 2 obesity area than in the type 1 arena. I, I believe there's lots of things to be had. But if you think about it, what will profoundly change what grows down here, there and who's busy breaking down our food, it will depend on what you put in in yes. the first place. Yes. And that connection will be indirect and be more complex. So that's why I think we need a kind of an individualist uh, AI approach and we'll learn eventually about what our optimized, it, it, it comes down to what your optimal diet is. The yeah. gut microbiome is so entrenched what I found always interesting. When you take antibiotics, your balance goes all the way out the window. Mm -hmm. We all know this, right? But then if you stop, your composition of your gut microbiome goes right back where it is at. It is extremely well stabilized between the immune system, the surface of the gut, and, and the bugs that are in there. So if you want to change this permanently into from, like, say, a disease into a healthy state, you would have to do it through, through understanding what, diet particularly for yourself is good and we are not there yet but i think we will we will get there yeah well, there's actually companies working on individualized diets how cool is this that's you know, amazing you know if you can essentially eat of your individual foods more if you know they're healthy for you and other foods that are not good for you you can cut them out but it gives you more choices yeah that's sort of what what i think is in store there for for us i think 
For me, the one thing I know that my gut loves, it loves two things. It loves arugula. (laughs) Yes, my favorite. Arugula. I don't know what it is in arugula. It's the home one for me. I always have the bucket of straight arugula with every meal. Every meal. Yep. It's the best, but... I I don't know why that is. It's (laughs) magic. Friends, get off the kale, get on the arugula. But the um, kale is an acquired taste, I would say. (laughs) One of the the new things that I've added, um, and they actually are a big supporter of the show because I've had success with it. And I had good success, but now I'm having extreme success since I interviewed the founder because then I understood how to use it better is a probiotic called Just Thrive. And so I had a basketball, (laughs) my flat abs were gone, my flat stomach was gone for a very long time. I will share the photos at some point, I'm gonna have to dig in, because I was doing an elimination diet for so long to figure out why I had this bowling ball or a basketball. And I started Just Thrive Probiotics after every meal. I was only doing it after one and I was seeing success and then I was forgetting that by the end of the day, the bowling ball would be back because I wasn't taking them after the bigger meals. And so Just Thrive Probiotics have changed everything for me. And I feel better and I have more energy and I don't have a bowling ball anymore. So friends, um, you know I've been talking about it for a really long time. If you haven't gotten it yet, uh, you can go to justthrive.com, use the promo code Heal Squad. Dr. M, you might want to try this. Um, use the the, the code Heal Squad, and you will get 20% off your first 90 day bottle of Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic. I also use Just Calm, which is it's this um, it's the supplement they have that calms the vagus nerve that goes down to the gut, and I've really loved it. Well, that gets you back to this whole innovation situation with the vagus nerve. That that probably in a selective way, which we not fully understand, yet it has a lot to do with many things, how also our pancreas works. And by, yeah, and I'm a big friend of probiotics. I mean, yeah. the, the, the probiotics are, are good for you. There's also, it's like the vitamin D thing, it's like the omega-3 thing. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that that gets you, whatever else you wanna do to heal the disease, it gets you in a good starting point rather mm-hmm. than starting here. You're starting here, and that's probably yeah, well, a very the, good idea. If the gut has everything it needs to do its yeah. job, what's yeah, cool yeah. about this one is it's one of the few that makes it to the intestines. Yeah. So you don't have to refrigerate it. Apparently, the probiotics that ask you to refrigerate are already so sensitive. That's why they make you refrigerate them. So anyhow, justthrive.com. Get your 20% off with the code Heal Squad and get your flat stomachs on. Get rid of your constipation, your bloat, and get your disease on the right track, whatever you're dealing with, let's heal from that. Uh, Dr. Matthias, this has been amazing. I would love to have 5 million more conversations with you about everything because I love your excitement for what you do and your passion. And I'm really hoping that we can get a cure for type one very, very soon for everyone who is is dealing with it. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to my dad after this, who's been that type one be diabetic fantastic. for over 50 years. He's 79, he's on a ladder right now on the roof. He's a beast. He is such an example. MIT wanted to study his body because they couldn't believe that he didn't have any side effects of diabetes after so many years, but he eats protein and vegetables. He is clean. doing something right. There's there's many patients who who live very long, healthy, good lives with with type di- type one diabetes. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I want to meet him. <laughs> yeah. So friends, thank you for being with us today. I hope this was uh, helpful to you on your journey to eating better, whether you have di- diabetes or not. Understanding the mechanisms in your body and and what's really going on when you cave to the dodles or yodels, whatever you call them. Um, I was there too. I used to do all of this, but I just understand it so much more, which is why I'm so passionate about sharing it with you. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. 
Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.